So John chapter 18 is where we find ourselves together uh, today, and our, our big idea, our main thought of John 18 is this, that Jesus' submission in humility is the road to his glory. All right, Jesus' submission in humility is the road to his glory. So keep that in mind as we go through this section in John chapter 18. We're going to look at the first 18 verses together in John 18 and, uh, and break those down together. So let's read that and then we'll go back through and we'll uh, break it into some pieces and, and take a look at it together today. So John 18.1 says this, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place where uh, place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, uh, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? Uh, they answered, him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I'm he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I'm he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I have told you all, uh, that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I've lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in it, into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup uh, which my father has given me? Verse 12, then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now Caiaphas, who advised, now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed uh, Jesus, uh, and so did another disciple. Uh, now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door uh, outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of the, this man's disciples, are you? He said to him, I'm not. Now the, servant, the servants and officers who made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Today we're looking at John chapter 18, verses 1 through 18. It's a major transition period in the Gospel of John. This is a shift from the, the teaching of Jesus with his disciples to now the hour that he's been talking about. His hour has finally come. And he's going to this hour, and as he, as he goes and he submits himself to this hour, our big idea is that this is the road to his glory. That, that the only way that Jesus can go to the thing that is going to most glorify and honor the Father, the way that he is going to be able to, to, to have this glory that we talked about last week in, or a couple weeks ago in Jesus' prayer, that the glory which he had before, before with the Father, the only way to get there is through humility is through this road of humility. And so today we're going to look at this section. We're going to break it down into three parts. The first will be verses 1 through 3, uh, which is Judas's betrayal is completed. And then secondly, verses 4 through 11, Jesus' submission is continued. And thirdly, verses 12 through 18, Peter's denial is commenced. If you remember, this, this may seem kind of familiar because previously, when Jesus began uh, having this, this final meal, this final dinner with his disciples, it revolved around these three men as well. It revolved around Judas and Jesus and Peter. And, and we're coming back to that again. We're kind of circling back around to now it's after the, the dinner, it's after the Last Supper, it's after the time of, of, of taking Passover together. And now Jesus has prayed with his disciples and he's going to the Garden of Gethsemane for some, some time alone with them again and some, some, uh, some specific time of prayer. And as he goes there, we see that John circles back around and he targets these three men again and what's happening with them. Now, we tend to spend most of our time avoiding humility, avoiding pain, avoiding hardship. 
We, we, don't, we don't necessarily run toward that. When there's an opportunity for humility, I think maybe someone else should take that. I should take the, the part that feels good to me and makes me feel awesome and, and uh, uh, really puffs up my pride. And sometimes we'll even go so far in avoiding humility that we will, we will actually sin to avoid humility. Have you noticed that to be true in your life? I know that I know that I've noticed that to be true in mine. That that a lot of times when I find myself in sin, it's because I'm avoiding the thing that the Lord's trying to lead me into. And I'm trying to, to insulate myself and isolate myself, and I'm trying to somehow keep myself away from that which God is, is bringing into my life. And so I end up in sin as a result. And this is because our belief about these things is backwards. That, that we look at suffering, and we look at shame, and we look at humility, and we think of them as bad things, as negative things. When in fact, uh, the, the, the truth is that they're not necessarily always bad. That the reason for this, the reason our thinking is backwards is because it comes from our serving our emotions instead of subjecting our emotions to the truth. And if we would in turn, instead of serve our emotions and follow and pursue whatever fleeting emotion comes through my life at that moment, at that time, whatever thing seems the best for me in that moment, if instead I would subject my emotions, instead of submit to my emotions, I would find that I would do the things that most honor God, that most glorify Him. And what most honors and most glorifies Him is always what's best for me. doesn't seem that way in the moment though. A lot of times it seems like this is really, this is going to hurt. This is going to cost. And I don't know if I really want to do that today. I, I, I was humble yesterday, Lord. Doesn't that count? Like, can't, can't we just count that one for today too? Uh, and, and the truth is that the Lord doesn't really necessarily look at it like that. You see, if it hurts or if it's difficult or I just don't like it, then I tend to see it as a curse and not a blessing. I tend to see it that way. Because blessings are seen as things that are added to my life, not things that are subtracted to, from my life. Have you noticed that that's the way you tend to think? I'm blessed. I got more. This is so prevalent in our way of thinking that I was, I was watching, uh, I don't remember what I was watching, but there was some late night show where, uh, you know, on late night shows, sometimes they'll go out in the street and they'll interview people. So they'll, they'll go out there and they'll just, you know, interview people and they'll ask them questions. And I'm always surprised at how dumb America really is <laughs> when I see this stuff. I go, how are we so foolish as to just not understand some simple things? And so, so one of the things that they did was uh, just this past week, there was this uh, announcement that in in the, the coming year, uh, Obamacare is now going to go up in its premiums, right? And so the word premium usually means good, right? If you get the premium package, that means good, right? So what they did was they went out in the street and they started telling people that it was a good thing that the premiums were going up. And because they had a camera and because they were telling people this, they started agreeing like, oh yeah, it's so great. Thank you so much, Obama, for my premiums going up. And it was just mind-blowing. It's just ridiculous. And the reason for that, a big part of it is that we tend to think more is better. More always means better. Uh, if I'm blessed, it's always going up. It's always adding. It's always more. And, and we got to get out of that mindset because it's not necessarily true. Sometimes the greatest blessings in your life will, bring the, will be the, the things that God brings into your life that are the most humiliating, the most painful, the most difficult. The things that you would avoid at all costs are the things that are the greatest blessings in your life. But we have a tendency to not think of it that way. And it's because we tend to serve our emotions. We tend to think if I feel good about it, then it is good. Not necessarily. And that's one of the things that I want to I kind of pull out for you and, and say keep in mind as we go through this because what we're going to see is that there is a, a, a contrast laid out for us here in that exact idea. We've been conditioned to think that more is better and less is worse. But the truth is that the pain and the difficulty are often the tools that God is using to refine you. They're not a reproach. They're a blessing. And so we need to be willing to go toward the pain sometimes. We need to be willing to go toward the humility sometimes and be willing to, to take on what it is that God's bringing into our lives. You see, when God's glory is your priority, you will often find yourself moving toward the source of pain instead of away from it. 
And so I just want to encourage you with that as we, as we think about and as we consider this section in John chapter 18. That's what we see Jesus actually doing. So let's look at the first piece, verses 1 through 3, Judas's betrayal. Or uh, another way to say this is that Judas is under control by Satan. Okay, it's Judas's betrayal. Verses 1 and 2, let's look at those again. It says this. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, and there was, a great, there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus has just completed his final teaching, right? We spent a, a long time on, uh, on this. If you remember, we started this final teaching in chapter 13. Okay, so 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and now we're beginning chapter 18. All of that time, there's lots of red words in that section of scripture. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's investing in them. He's pouring out his heart into them. And then we read in chapter 17 that he, he encapsulates or finishes his teaching by praying. And I think that that's a, a major part of Jesus' teaching of his disciples, that he's praying with them. He's praying for them. He's praying out loud, instructing them through his very prayer. So he pours out his heart into these disciples, these 11 men, and he pours out his heart before his father. And as he does this, he's ready now for his hour. This hour that we've been moving toward. This, this time that we've seen all throughout the Gospel of John. His hour has not yet come. His hour has not yet come. His hour has not yet come. And now, now Jesus' hour has come. Previous to this, there's been many attempts on Jesus' life. There's been many attempts for them to arrest Jesus or push him off a cliff or whatever. And then Jesus, it says, the, the commentary of John says, it wasn't the hour of Jesus. And so he slipped through the crowd or he teleported himself. I don't know what he did exactly. It doesn't really tell us, but he just wasn't there where they could do that to him anymore because it wasn't his hour. And so now we see here, as we just read, Jesus submits himself to being arrested because it is his hour. This is the time. He has now come here. Now, you, you probably noticed as we read through this section in John 18 that much of what the synoptic gospels or Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic just means synopsis, okay? So overview, all right? They, they all, all three of those, uh, tend to do more of an overview of the life and ministry of Jesus where John, he doesn't do that. He targets some specific things. You may have noticed as we read through this that there's some stuff left out. Like, what about Jesus, you know, as he's praying, great drops of blood? What about that part? Not there. What, what about Jesus going back to the disciples and saying, hey, why weren't you praying with me? Not there. J John goes for something specific. Because if you remember, one of the major functions of John's gospel, one of the major things that he's going for as he writes this, is to lift up Jesus as God. And so that's what he targets, He's lifting up and targeting the deity of Jesus. And so he doesn't go after some of the details that we've already, we've already seen. It's as if John is saying, if you want to read about that, read the other Gospels. I'm going to target something else. Right? I, want to, I want to let you know something else that's going here. And so Jesus goes out to uh, the garden or an olive grove. All right? So when you think of garden, don't think of you know, your grandma's tulips. Okay? That's not necessarily what they're, they're talking about. Uh, uh, this garden is an olive grove trees that stand there and he goes across the, the brook Kidron and he goes into this uh, garden known as Gethsemane. And as he's there, he spends some time with his disciples and it's a familiar place that Jesus visited often with the disciples. And so Jesus, Judas knew about it. I think it's an important uh, detail that we see there in verse two, that Judas knew about the place because Jesus was there often. You see, Jesus is fully aware of what Judas is doing. He's not caught off guard by it. Do you remember uh, at the dinner when, when Jesus hands the, the, um, the, the piece of bread to, to Judas and uh, it says that he, he took it, that Jesus says to him, what you do, do quickly? He knew exactly what Jesus was doing. He knew what Judas was doing. Jesus knew exactly what Judas was doing. There was nothing surprising about this whatsoever. And so Jesus goes to a familiar place. He goes to a place that he would often visit, knowing full well that Judas knew he would be there and that Judas would look for him there. Jesus doesn't go into hiding. He doesn't, he doesn't seclude himself. He doesn't insulate himself. He doesn't isolate himself. He doesn't avoid the pain. He goes toward the pain. He knew full well that he was going to be found. He knew full well that this was going to be the time now that, that uh, God wa was pushing forward this hour and Jesus moves toward it. 
he, he goes where he will be found. Notice verse 3. It says this, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Judas was, was quite unwilling to go the way of difficulty. See the contrast there? That, that Jesus is willing to go toward difficulty and toward pain, and Judas is quite unwilling to do this. He's, he's unwilling to go the way of hardship. And we clearly read in the other Gospels the very reason why Judas betrays Jesus, and it's for money. That, that he betrays him for money. That that's why. That, that there's some people, they want to try to put some sort of, of good spin on Judas. And maybe Judas was just trying to provoke Jesus to be the king of Israel that everyone thought he was. And maybe somehow they, that Judas was just uh, playing, trying to play into Jesus' hand. Don't, don't read anything good into Judas' motive whatsoever. There's nothing at all good about Judas' motive. He was greedy. He wanted money. He saw an opportunity. That's it. That it's, very, it's very simple in terms of what's going on within Judas. And so he betrays Jesus. And so he has this greedy heart that is filled to the point of entertaining a satanic thought. And then he entertains that satanic thought and that produces within him satanic desire to the point to where he's actually filled by Satan himself. This is, this is the progression of Judas. We, we have a tendency... And I think that this is something for us to see in Judas. Not that Christians can be demon-possessed, because they, you cannot, okay? It's impossible for light and darkness to inhabit the same place. You can be oppressed by Satan, absolutely, but you cannot be uh, uh, in, indwelled with demonic activity whatsoever. It's not possible, because the Spirit of the living God lives inside the Christian, and therefore it's impossible for light and darkness to be in the same place. As, as much as light is stronger than darkness, is as, mu- is as strong as the Lord is over the enemy. But we can see here that there's this steady progression of Judas. We have a tendency to, you ever heard the phrase, I fell into sin? You ever, heard, you ever said that maybe? I fell into sin, they fell into sin, we've fallen into this. We have a tendency to think of sin as though I'm just kind of walking along and there's a hole and I didn't see it and I just fell in it. Uh, that, that's how we kind of tend to see sin. But it's much less of an accidental, I tripped and fell in this hole and it's much more of a steady, progressive decline into something. That I'm making certain choices little by little that are leading me away from the Lord and deeper into this pit. That you don't fall into it as much as you progressively just walk down into it. And this is what we see happening with Judas. And I think it's up to us to see this with Judas and to be warned and say, no, I'm not going to go that way. Uh, I need to recognize and and pray, God, make my heart tender toward you. Holy Spirit, keep my accounts with you very short. Convict me of my sin. Give me the courage to confess it before you and to repent before you. Not to just make room for it and progressively go further and further and further away. That this is what we should see within the life of Judas, that when we fall into sin, it's less of an accidental hole and more of a steady, purposeful decline. If there's anything we should learn from Judas, it's this. Stop now. Stop now. Don't continue in sin. Don't harden your heart. Because the reason we do that is, we think, oh, I'll just repent tomorrow. But tomorrow may never come. Tomorrow may never come. No one's promised tomorrow. Life is very fragile. It's, it's fleeting. It's here one day and gone the next. The Bible says that our life is like grass. It's here today and gone tomorrow. That's the way. It's like vapor. You see it for a moment and then it's gone. Like this morning. I don't know if you noticed this morning, but there was a thick fog over everywhere. It's like, that's like life. It's gone now. It's burned off. That is your life. You only have one life and it's soon going to be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. So let's think about what most honors him, what most brings glory to him and pursue those things. Um, Hebrews chapter 3 targets this idea. We'll put it on the screen for you. It says this, Hebrews 3.12 in the New Living Translation says, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened uh, against God. We need to warn one another. We need to challenge one another. We need to be willing to say, hey, you shouldn't go that way. It may not look like a big deal today, but a little bit off now is a big off later down the road. I mean, if you were to get in a plane 
and to head toward Hawaii. If you're two degrees off, it may not seem like a big deal here, but if you are two degrees off, by the time you get over there, you're not even going to see the island. We've we got to make sure that we're course correcting at all times. And you need people in your life. One of the things that, that Hebrews is talking about here is that you need other people. Christianity is not a solo thing. You can't do it on your own. You need the body of Christ. And they need you. We need one another. And we need to be willing to be those kind of people that share life together to the point to where we're willing to risk it all and to say, hey, you probably shouldn't do that. You probably shouldn't go that way. It shouldn't just be me saying, hey, don't do that, <laughs> right? We should do that with each other. We should be willing to, to step out and to, to say, I love you enough to say something about this. I love you enough to point some things out. And so let's be those kind of people. Let's be willing to stand up for righteousness' sake. And so Judas shows up, we see there in verse 3, with a small army or a large mob, okay? And he does so, and John tells us that Judas has both Roman soldiers and Jewish temple guards. See that in verse 3? It says that when Judas received a detachment of troops, that's Roman soldiers, okay? And then also we see that he has and officers from the chief priests. This is Jewish temple guard, okay? So he's got a mix of these people that are coming with him. And, and as he's going down to find Jesus there, he knows where to, to look. And uh, if we're to take this literally, which I'm not sure if John means this literally or not, but as he's saying this, this could mean hundreds of armed men. Hundreds. And they come, notice what it tells us at the end of verse 3, with lanterns, torches, and weapons. They're going to this olive grove, and it's night, and they're coming with lanterns and torches and weapons. They're, come, they're coming expecting for Jesus to be hiding, right? So we need, we've got this massive garden, this olive grove that we've got to look through and search through, and so everyone get a torch, you know, everyone light your torches and go out and find Shrek or, you know, whatever. So we're looking for Jesus. And so they're looking for him through this olive grove. And they come with these lanterns and torches. And, and they come preparing to search for him. But they're also ready for war if they need to fight as well. So they've got their weapons as well. It's a, it's a very intimidating force. A large amount of men come. And, and to their surprise, they show up and they find Jesus right away. They're not expecting to do this. And they find him right away. They're, they're expecting to look for him in hiding, but they find him uh, in the open. And so not only do we see, number one, Judas' betrayal, but we also see, number two, Jesus' submission is continued. Or, verses 4 through 11 uh, also stated, he's in control of everything. He's in control of everything. As you read through this, notice the control that Jesus has. Look at verses 4 through 9 real quick. It says this, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered uh, him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I'm he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I lost none. Can you imagine? Just put yourself there. Think of it maybe like a movie. As you're watching the movie and, and, and you see this all unfolding, the 11 had no clue that Judas was betraying Jesus. Remember when Jesus had dinner with them and, and he said, one of you is going to betray me? They all asked, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? And then when Judas left, they thought maybe he's going to go buy some stuff for the, for the dinner or maybe he's going to go give some money to the poor or something. And when he left, they had no idea what he was doing. And, and they don't see him again until he shows up with a small army looking to arrest Jesus. Can you imagine what's happening in their minds in that moment? All of the betrayal that they feel, all of the shock that they feel in that moment of... Here's this army coming and Judas is leading the charge. What happened? I mean, this is the man that Jesus trusted with the money. He's the, he's the one that sh they would have trusted all the more. They never suspected it was Judas. And so he shows up. And as he shows up and, and they're all in shock and wondering what's going on, Jesus steps forward to speak to the mob. And up to this point, they had no idea about the betrayal. And so Jesus knows exactly what's happening, and it's not a surprise in the least to him. And his question to them is, who are you seeking? See that there in verse uh, 4? 
<clears throat> he says, whom are you seeking? Now, now, when you read this, this isn't because he doesn't know, right? He, it's, he's not unsure. Hey, who, what are you guys looking for? What are you guys doing? You guys out for a stroll tonight? Nice, nice pitchforks, you know? Um, like, th- that's, not, that's not what the question that Jesus is asking. He knows exactly what they're doing. He knows exactly why they're there. And he's giving them this question, not because he's unsure, but this is, see this, it's an extension of grace toward Judas. He's giving Judas another opportunity to repent even in the middle of his betrayal, even in that. This should remind you of something. Was there another time in Scripture when when the Lord asks a question that he already knows the answer to? It reminds me of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 in in, uh, verse uh, 14, or no, not verse 14. It's just, I I didn't look up the verse. So Genesis 3, in there, around 9, somewhere around there. God comes to the garden after Adam and Eve have sinned. And he says, where are you? Adam, where are you? It's not because he didn't know. It's because he's extending grace. He's giving an opportunity for repentance. And as God gives us these opportunities, we need to take them. Because if we don't and we harden our hearts, it always leads us away from the Lord. And Judas ends up committing suicide, hanging himself, because he never repented. Not because forgiveness wasn't extended, but because he wouldn't take it. Because he hardened his heart against the Lord. You see, even in the moment of Judas's betrayal, Jesus extends another opportunity for him to repent. And we see here in verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus says to them, I am he. Jesus says, I am he. Now, Jesus' answer to their question uh, displays without a shadow of doubt his very existence as God. His deity. I mean, if you've somehow, traveling through John, if you've missed this, I don't know how it's possible, but if somehow you get to chapter 18 and you think, well, maybe Jesus is just a guy that God uses. And, and, you know, God used him to perform some miracles. God used him to turn water into wine. God used him to raise the dead, to heal the blind. Uh, Maybe if somehow, through all of these I am statements that Jesus has made throughout the Gospel of John, you missed him, his claim of deity, he, he unequivocally settles the case here in chapter 18. That, that as he takes upon himself the name of God, in your Bible, uh, if you notice there in verse 5, it says, probably says, I am he. Notice that the word he is italicized there. Whenever you see italicized words in, your, in the Bible, what that means is that it's a word that's not found in the original text, the Greek uh, text, that it's a word that's added by the translator for the sake of giving you understanding, okay? So it's just... So, Anyone who speaks two languages knows that when you're trying to translate, it doesn't always translate straight across. All right, you, you know some Spanish maybe, or and you try to tell a joke that makes it's really funny in Spanish, and then people that speak English are like, "Yeah, I don't get it." Uh, it's because it doesn't translate straight across. It just doesn't. It doesn't really go. Okay, and, and so sometimes an additional word is necessary to try to grasp the concept of what's going on. And so they, I am he, right? They, he's just they. They add this word he, but it's not in the Greek text. I am, is what's found in the Greek text. He says, "I am." He's claiming very clearly out of Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, the name of God as God met with Moses in the burning bush. And he said, who should I say sent me? Very clearly, he's, he's claiming the very same name. And notice what happens, that as he says this, verse 6, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, it wasn't that they were shocked. Oh, Jesus came and he wasn't hiding. Oh, no, and they take a step back and they're so closely packed together that they just fall over. Like that's, Don't try to explain this away, that they just tripped on each other Oh, they all fell down like dominoes. Not at all. The very force of God's presence was there with them and it knocked them all back just with his words. Can you see that in your mind? Very strong Roman soldiers all geared up, ready for war and they can't even stand up in the presence of Jesus. Hundreds of them. It's crazy. See, Jesus claims the name of God and he displays the authority of God as well in this. But as his power is unleashed on this entire mob, it knocks him to the ground and it shows us that he's in complete control. They they can't even stand up unless he lets them. Unless he lets them do this. Much less take him into custody. I mean, how are you going to arrest this? What what kind of stands out to me is is verse uh, 7. 
Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, like, what were they thinking in this moment exactly? Why did they start talking to him again? I mean, if some guy can talk and knock over an entire small army, uh, you should probably maybe tread a little lightly with this guy. Um, and, and they just, they get, they get back up. I'm, I don't know if they're confused or like, what happened there? And they just dust themselves off. It's like, hey, so who are you guys looking for again? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I, I'm, it's me. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know why they started com- conversing with him. I, I think, you know, maybe they, uh, maybe they just didn't really know what was going on. Or maybe they're like, we got a, we got a job to fill. Why do we follow? I don't know why you fell over. Uh, why you tripped me, bro? And uh, so they just kind of keep moving forward. The words of Jesus <laughs> alone were enough to call, cause this mob to fall over, but they're not concerned w- with that whatsoever. They just, they're still on their mission to take him into custody. And so Jesus says in, in verse 8, notice what he says. He says, I'm he. And then he says this, Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. And he's motioning to his disciples, the 11. You're here for me. Leave them alone. You see how Jesus puts himself in harm's way? And he protects the many he loves. Then in verse 4, he steps forward. He doesn't wait for someone else to go talk to him. He doesn't wait for one of his disciples to go and try to be the delegate for Jesus. No, he steps forward. He comes right up to them and he engages them. That, that, that now that he's going to submit himself to them and let, him, let them tie his hands or, you know, they didn't have handcuffs or whatever they did. They bound him like handcuffs. He puts his hands out and says, take me, but let these go their way. And there's probably like a motion to them. Hey, guys you should leave now, (laughs) you know? Oh, I get the hint. We're out of here, you know? And so they take off. Now in this, he's so concerned with the glory of God and the safety of of his disciples. And so he peacefully goes with the mob. It's It's a complete contrast between Judas and Jesus. It's a complete contrast. Judas was, what he wants most is to glorify himself. And so he's willing to sacrifice someone else to glorify himself. And Jesus is so concerned with the glory of God that he's willing to sacrifice himself for the benefit of somebody else. It's a, it's a contrast shown for us here. And what we've got to see is, I tend to be Judas, not Jesus. And unless the Lord invades my soul and he takes over, I'm going to go the way of Judas. I'm going to choose myself. I'm going to choose my safety. I'm going to choose my comfort over the glory of the Lord. You see, the result is that Jesus moves toward the pain to protect others, and Judas moves toward comfort to protect himself. Here's what we see happening. Now, we see in verses 10 and 11 that it says that Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? A lot's happening really fast right now. You know, Jesus, Judas shows up with a mob. Jesus knocks him over. There's just kind of a lot happening. And, and so uh, I imagine that Peter is probably filled with a lot of uh, anxiety and uncertainty. And probably what's going through his mind is, I told Jesus, Jesus I'd die with him. I better make good on my promise. So, whooshink. you know, concealed carry is biblical, by the way. He had a sword. <laughs> just saying. So pulls it out. And he goes, after, uh, he goes after Malchus. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm just going to venture a guess here. Peter's probably not going for the critical ear blow, you know, uh, like the critical strike of, let me chop off your ear, ha! You know, like it's not this precision moment. I think he's probably just not really good with a sword uh, and missed, all right? And also notice who he goes after. So there's, a, there's an army there, right? And he picks the high priest's servant, He's a civilian, <laughs> so he goes after the unarmed civilian <laughs> and goes after him. Some commentators would actually say that Peter probably took him out uh, from behind uh, because uh, if Peter's right-handed, which most people are, and he cut off Malchus's right ear, how did he go all the way across his head and just get his ear? Well, it's probably likely maybe he was behind him. I, I don't know. Uh, there's nothing in, in the scripture that tells us that, but All that to say, it's not necessarily the most brave thing that he's doing. He's targeting a civilian. He misses, chops off his ear, uh, and Jesus Jesus stops the whole thing. I mean, this could have incited a a, a crazy battle right there. All the disciples lose their lives. All the work that Jesus is doing to try to protect them, all of a sudden, 
Judas, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Peter goes after this guy. And so Jesus, we're told in the other gospels, heals him. I don't know if he picked up the ear, popped it back on his head, or if he just made a new ear grow out. I don't know, but he healed the guy, or maybe just made it stop bleeding, and there's no ear there still. I don't really know. But he says he healed him, and, and he tells Peter, put your, put your sword away. Put your sword away. Notice what he says there. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? It's God's plan. It's not accidental. This is the hour. This is the time. They're not in control, Peter. I know it looks like it, but remember, I just knocked them down with my words. I'm going with them freely, willingly. I'm willingly submit my, submitting myself to them. Jesus says in Matthew, one of, one of the, the coolest things about this that I really love, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, Jesus tells Peter, if I wanted to fight, I could fight. And I wouldn't even have to fight for myself. I could call right now 12 legions, more than 12 legions of angels to come and fight for me. Okay, just to kind of give you an idea of what this means, because we don't really use the term legion uh, in, in our terminology. So a legion is right around 6,800 troops. Okay, 6,800. That's one. And so he says, I can call more than 12. Okay, so 12 would be right around 82,000 angels. You could say that they, could, they would come and fight for me right now. Okay, so, so just to kind of give you an idea of the, the power of an angel and kind of what they can do, uh, in Isaiah chapter seven, uh, 37, verse 36, we'll put it on the screen for you, it says this. Then the angel of the Lord, okay, so what's happening is um, Jerusalem is being surrounded by Assyria and they're afraid because Assyria is, gonna, is coming there to wipe them out. And so God says, don't worry about it. I'm going to fight for you, okay? And so it says this in Isaiah 37, 36, that then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And the people rose early in the morning and uh, there were the corpses all dead. So one angel on one night destroyed 185,000 troops. That's crazy. So what do you think more than 12 legions could do? Decimate the entire world. Jesus is saying, if I wanted to have a hostile takeover, I could do that and I wouldn't even have to lift a finger, okay? Guys, I'm not looking for you to fight for me. That's not what I'm looking for you to do. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for a completely different purpose. Peter, put away your sword. I'm going toward humility. I'm going toward pain. I'm going toward difficulty. Not away from it. I don't need you guys to fight for me. And so... We see this angel uh, can do uh, quite a bit of damage. Jesus' life is not being taken. It's being sacrificed. That's what Jesus is saying. Notice thirdly and finally in verses 12 through 18. Now Peter's denial is commenced. That, that, that Judas is under control by Satan. Jesus is in control of everything. And Peter is out of control of himself. Verse 12. 12 through 14. Then... Uh, the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas uh, first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now, it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Here we have kind of a transitioning section of Scripture going from the garden into now where Jesus is going to be on trial literally all night. Illegal trials uh, where Jesus is going to go from one place to the next to the next, kept up all night long on trial over and over again. It's this multiple illegal trials of Jesus throughout this night. And the first place they go to is Annas. See that there? Um, in uh, verse 13, they first go to Annas. And this is because he had held the office of high priest uh, in the past, and he was actually the power behind the office, okay? A little bit later on, next week, what we're going to see in the, in the very beginning of our section next week is that they refer to Annas as the high priest, okay? So they refer to him as the high priest, even though he's not the sitting high priest. He's the one who is the, literally the power behind the office. Uh, history tells us that four of his sons and one of his son-in-laws uh, were actually high priest. So he was able to get them elected, if you will. He was able to put them in office. He was the one who was actually the authority, actually the uh, power behind this high priest. Caiaphas is his son-in-law. Uh, and so the, they first stop with Annas, and he has this, this office there uh, of high priest. And so they begin with him. He's the one who has the, the authority, essentially. He is the power, even though Caiaphas is the figurehead. And so 
they, they go to him and they begin uh, this trial with Jesus. And we're also told in verse 14 a little bit of a detail here. It says, now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. This is back in John chapter 11, verse 50. Okay, we read this in John 11. I know that was a long time ago, and you guys are like, I don't even remember. There's, there is a John 11? Um, yes, and we did cover it. So if you want to check that out online, you absolutely can. All of our teachings are online, um, and, and you can catch up on that or if you, or if you forgot about it. But uh, we, we see there that Caiaphas, in that time in John 11, he accidentally prophesied. Because he, he, being high priest, the Lord still used him, even though he wasn't necessarily submitted to the Lord. And it's because of his office, not because he's a spiritual man, okay? They, that it was the office that God was honoring that he had, not because he was a spiritual man. And, and sometimes for you and I, we need to honor the office, even if the man isn't honorable. Sometimes you got to, you may not like the president, you may not like the president in a couple of months, okay? It doesn't matter. You honor the office, not the person, okay? Sometimes the person is not honorable, but you still honor the office. And so we, we can apply that in a lot of ways in our lives. We can apply that maybe to your parents, maybe to your boss at work. That dude's a jerk. Um, I don't really like him, and he does bad stuff. Okay, well, he still is your boss, okay? And unless he tells you to do something sinful, you honor the office. You honor the office, okay, even if the man's not honorable. And so... He's able to, to say, speak this prophecy, and on his part, it's absolutely accidental. He doesn't even know what he's talking about, and he says it's expedient or it's good that one man should die for the people. And he's prophesying about Jesus sacrificing himself for the people. It's this crazy thing. He doesn't even know what he's talking about, and yet he's talking about Jesus. What he was saying is, well, if somehow Jesus raises up this insurrection and the Romans kill him, that's cool. Then Jesus will die on half of the Jewish people, uh, on behalf of the Jewish people, and we won't have to worry about it. They'll just take care of our problem for us. That's what uh, Caiaphas was talking about. Seemed very logical to Caiaphas, and, and in any human standpoint, that's a very logical thing to say. But it's not spiritual at all. It's not spiritual at all. And you and I need to be very careful of doing and thinking things that are logical from a human perspective, but completely unspiritual. We can fall into this trap over and over and over again. Here's one that's very easy for you, okay? Here's a, a very simple one. Here's a softball for you. Don't just apply it this way. It applies in lots of different ways, okay? It may seem very logical and you have lots of reasons. I've had lots of people tell me this before, that it may seem logical and have a lot of reasons why you should live together before you get married. It's cheaper, you know, we don't have to pay two places of rent. It's easier because we have all these different things going on in life. And so it's just really, it's just hard for us to live apart before we get married. That's logical. I, I can understand why that makes sense from a human standpoint, but it's not spiritual. It's not honoring to the Lord. It's not godly. And if you will choose what is hard and what is sacrificial and even what costs you over what is most comfortable for you, the Lord will always honor that. He'll always honor that. And so that's one, there's one, okay? There's lots of those in our lives. And we are constantly at a, a crossroads with this. Is, is it logical but unspiritual? Then I need to choose the spiritual over what seems to make sense to me in the moment. All right? And so... Caiaphas, his goal is, uh, is that pain and suffering are going to be avoided. And so he passes this pain and suffering on, uh, on to another to endure, being Jesus. It's logical, but it's not spiritual. Notice verse 15. It says, And Simon, Peter, followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known, th this other disciple, by the way, it's John. Okay, John's the only one that doesn't name himself in his gospel. So when it's vague and uncertain, the, the disciple Jesus loved, this right here where it's this uncertain, weird terms around, he just didn't want to name himself, okay? So in humility, he's just not even naming himself, but it's John, okay? So, and Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now, that disciple, John, was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside, uh, then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He, sa uh, he said, I am not. Now the servant and, servants and the officers who had uh, made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. And the commotion of everything... As they're leaving and fleeing from the garden, Peter and John end up together. 
And they think, let's follow Jesus. Let's go, let's, let's follow after him and see what's going on. Let's, let's see if we can, maybe somehow we can help him. Maybe somehow we can be there for him. And let's just, let's just be there. And so John, um, we are told here, is known uh, by the high priest. And so he has access to the house. But as he goes through, Peter stopped at the gate. So John just goes through and he's like, hey, how's it going? And he just keeps going on. Peter stopped at the gate. And so John's got to turn back around and go back and, and, and uh, rescue Peter and get him in. And so he goes back to, to get Peter in. And what he sees is that there's this conversation that's taking place. And so as Peter is talking with the gatekeeper, it's, uh, she asks Peter uh, if, if she's one of Jesus' disciples. Now, there's one word in there that I want to I target for you. Uh, the word that that she, that she uses is the word also. Do you see that there in verse 17? Also. This word infers that she knew that John was one of Jesus' disciples. Okay? So it infers that she knew, that it was known that John was one of the disciples. And so she says, I assume because you're with him that you're one of the disciples as well. And goes, oh, no, 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 no. No, I, I don't even, who's Jesus? I've never even heard of this guy. I don't know what you're even talking about. And so he begins there in that moment, his decline, his denial of Jesus begins in that moment. See, maybe it, w- maybe it was that he was caught off guard by the question or maybe it was a character flaw in Peter. I don't really know, but Peter falls p- prey to the same thing that Caiaphas fell prey to, an unspiritual logic. That in that moment, self-preservation rises to the top and he goes that way. He acts outside of faith to preserve himself. I mean, they arrested Jesus. I don't know what's going to happen to Jesus. And I mean, I don't want, I don't want that to happen to me necessarily. So I'm just going to play it cool. And maybe, maybe this will give me an in. I can slip under the radar and I can even get closer to Jesus somehow. I, I don't know exactly what's going through his mind, but it's something along those lines. It's something about self-preservation. It's something about logic, not spiritual matters. And so he, he falls prey to this. See what What Peter thought was impossible actually happens. Remember when Jesus said, you're going to deny me tonight, Peter? And he said, no, I'll never do that. It was impossible in Peter's mind. Jesus, I love you so much. I'll die for you, Jesus. And, and earlier he tried to prove it, you know, by taking off someone's ear. And, uh, you know, Jesus stops the whole thing and says, no, not that. We're not doing that. And so now Peter, in the middle of all this, he ends up beginning to deny Jesus. What he thought was impossible actually happens in this moment. And Peter failed in the moment of temptation because he wasn't ready for it. He failed in the moment of temptation because he wasn't ready for it. He hadn't already made the decision. He hadn't already made the decision. And there's a lot of temptations that you and I will face that you can make the decision beforehand So that when you are in the moment of temptation, you don't fall prey to sin. You don't fall prey to sin. Don't don't try to make the decision in the moment. Because in the moment, you're probably going to make the wrong choice. In the moment, you'll be overcome with the situation, with the, the timing of things, the way that it was asked, any number of things, your emotion in that time. Uh, you don't know how it's all going to play out. So you've got to decide some things before you get there or you will absolutely make the wrong choice. This is something that is, is, is huge in the life of Daniel, Daniel the prophet. As a young man, he lived in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was taken captive uh, by the Babylonians. And one of the things that happened was they took all of the young men. And Daniel was one of those men that was taken captive by the Babylonians. And he was put into Babylonian school, basically Babylonian college, you know, to become like the Babylonians. He learned their language, learned their culture, learned their stuff, and and was on a track to become one of the servants of the king. We're told something interesting about Daniel. We'll put it on the screen for you. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, it says this, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies. Daniel purposed in his heart. That means he decided beforehand. He didn't wait until he was taken captive. He didn't wait until he was in Babylon. He didn't wait to see what everyone else was going to do. He didn't wait to find out what's this going to be like. How is this all going to play out? What's going to best serve me in the moment? He decided, no matter what, I will not defile myself before the Lord. And so when the opportunity came to him, he was able to choose the right. He was able to go the the correct direction. He was able to choose what's spiritual over what's logical. 
Because in that time, what it was is, here, eat of the king's delicacies. Essentially, it's the meat sacrificed to idols. And so he couldn't defile his conscience before the Lord. I will not participate in your idolatry, your idol worship. And so he said, hey, just give us vegetables. Just give us vegetables. And, you know, if you're like, uh, if you want to lift weights and, you know, get yoked, you got to have some protein, bro. You know, you're not going to get that from broccoli. And so he's, you know, he's like, just give us water and broccoli, and we'll be good. And it says that they were fatter, not that they got chubby, but that they, they looked better. They were, their bodies filled out better than everyone else who was eating all, all the other stuff. Conventional wisdom was what they were giving to him. He chose spiritual, the spiritual path, and the Lord blessed him in the middle of it. And so you and I, we need to be willing to do the same, but you've got to decide before you get in the situation. You've got to decide now, outside of times of conflict, what are you going to do? Because when the conflict happens, it's just reactions. And what you've decided will, will play out. And if, if you've decided nothing, then you've decided to follow the way of your flesh. That's what you're going to do. On Tuesday, we, uh, we're going through uh, Joshua in our life group. And we see that um, in jo- the, the end of Joshua 6, uh, verse 27, it says that Joshua was known for being a man of God, that his reputation spread for being a man of God. It was just a, a really cool insight that we talked about just in, in this idea that, that Joshua was known for God working through him. And, and the question that, that I want to ask is, are you willing to have your name associated with Jesus? Because that's what's happening right here with Peter. He's struggling with having his name associated with, Peter, with Jesus. He, he does, he's not sure if he really wants that. Is it worth it? Is it, is it worth the cost? And do I really want to go that way? And if, if we're not careful, we won't be willing to have our name associated with Jesus. And, and sometimes we're too busy covering up being known by the name of the Lord with being known by other things. It's not that I necessarily don't want to be called a Christian. It's that I'm just going to kind of cover that over with other stuff. I'm going to be the guy that knows every football stat. I'm going to be the guy that knows everything about cars. I'm going to be the guy that knows everything about um, banking or uh, leadership principles or um, I don't know, what else did I write down? Um, computers and technology or I'm the, I'm the hunting guy. I'm the gun guy. If you want to talk about something about guns, you come talk to me about that stuff. You want to know how to kill something or take its skin off? I'll tell you how to do that. You know, we, we tend to retreat into all these things that, that I know this stuff and then I become known by that stuff. And because I'm known by that, it's, it's this thing that overshadows my life and then I can kind of slip Jesus in under there. He's not content with that. He's not going to be. He's going to dethrone those things in your life. And the worst thing that can be said of you is is that someone would go, oh, I didn't didn't know you were a Christian. That's the worst thing. I want want Jesus' name to be written across my life. I I want the reason, the reason I work so hard at work It's not because I love money. It's because I love Jesus. That's why I work so hard. The reason I'm willing to do stuff for you and to serve and sacrifice for you, it's not because I'm a great guy. It's because I love Jesus. The reason that you can count on me and I'll be there, it's not because I'm awesome. It's because I love Jesus. We've got to make sure that Jesus is the banner written over our lives and that everything about us fits into that. Now, is it bad to know stats about football? Not at all. Is it bad to root for the Broncos? Not at all, especially if, you know, someone else in the church goes for the Raiders, you know? Then <laughs> it's not, it's, there's nothing wrong with those things. It's not, it's not bad to have healthy competition about stuff. It's not bad to, to know other things, but, but when we try to be known for that instead of being known for Jesus, we've, we've disoriented our lives and we've placed things in an improper order. And so I just want to challenge you with that. I just want to challenge you with that. Are you willing to be associated with the name of Jesus? You see, some of our betrayal is just a cover-up to avoid difficult or painful situations. You know, it's just, if I just cover this whole Jesus thing up, then it just makes life smoother. And that in itself is a betrayal that we fall prey to. It may very well be that the painful situation that you're trying to avoid in this very moment is exactly what Jesus is trying to use for his glory in your life. Are you willing to go that way? Or are you going to go the way of Caiaphas and go the way of Peter and go the way of Judas and choose and choose what seems logical, seems best for me in the moment? Will you submit yourself or will you protect yourself? That's the question. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. We thank you for the chance to study it together. And we pray that you would help us, Lord. 
to be able to not only just understand what your word has to say, but to apply it to our lives. Make us to be people who pursue you and honor you, and glorify you. Lord, help us, to, help us to go that difficult way. It doesn't seem logical. It, it, it seems foolish. And there's a bunch of people lining up to tell us all the reasons why it's, it's wrong and we shouldn't do it. But Lord, deep in our heart, we know we're led by you and, and that even though it hurts, it's the way we should go. So Lord, I, I just pray that you would help us to be a people of faith. That you give us courage to follow you in faith. And that we wouldn't, we wouldn't wait until the moment to decide what we're going to do, but that you would you'd help us to predetermine right now, I will honor the Lord. I will serve him. I will name the name of Jesus. He will be my God. And I will serve him with my life. And so, Father, we commit the rest of this day to you, saying thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today